waterways of England and the life of the waterways. Most people think of it as a romantic life of sunshine and leisure. But the waterways do a job of work. These are the boats and the cargoes they carry and the people of the boats. longer do a job of work.
Natural waterways were man's first means of communication and travel. He could float a raft down a river and by sea round the coasts. But as rafts developed into boats, which drew more water, ways had to be found to provide more depth. One way of doing it was to build an artificial weir with a removable staunch. When it was closed, the level of the stretch of river above it rose sufficiently for boats to pass over the shallows. These were locks of a kind, but they could only pass small boats and handle moderate traffic. Something more efficient was needed, and soon the first pound locks appeared. In 1566, in order to bypass weirs on the River X, a canal with three pound locks was built to carry ships up to Exeter. Other rivers were improved, for rivers had become the highways of the country. Rivers, not roads, for roads were bad and there were not many of them. Rivers, not railways, for railways had not been invented. Then, in 1759, James Brindley designed a canal to carry coal to Manchester from the Duke of Bridgewater's mine at Worsley. The canal tunnelled for six miles through the rock to the coal faces. In all, there were 40 miles of underground waterways. Along them, flat-bottomed primitive boats that served as coal tubs were dragged hand over hand by staples driven into the tunnel walls. Today, the boats and sluices are derelict. The mine is worked out. The basin is choked with reeds and sunken craft. But from Worsley to Manchester, Brindley's canal, little changed, serves the coal industry still. The Bridgewater Canal was successful. In the next few years, the cutting of scores of canals was authorised by Parliament, and plans were drawn up for their construction. Crazily ambitious schemes were proposed. If they'd all gone through, they would have linked every important town in the country by water. Some of them came to nothing. Others quickly failed, but many prospered. The men who built the canals were the pioneers of civil engineering. Smeaton, Brindley the millwright, Telford the bridge builder, Rennie and Jessop, men who were undeterred by any obstacle. Over the Lancashire hills and the Yorkshire moors and up onto the Midland watershed went their canals, locked from level to level. And if one lock was insufficient, they gave the boats a staircase to climb. If they came to a river, they went over it. If they couldn't go round a hill, they went through it. The result looked like this. An intricate network serving nearly the whole country, linking natural waterways, the navigable rivers, by artificial canals. Then, 1825. After the canal boom, the railway boom. Before long, canal owners were facing a slump. Slowly, the traffic on the canals dwindled. Sometimes, because as time went by, other forms of transport outpaced it. Sometimes, because the centres of industry were changing and shifting, and often the canals could no longer serve the purpose for which they were built. Neglect led to dereliction and often to abandonment. But some of the canals continued to thrive. Many of them did not come under railway ownership and these are the canals which still carry the largest tonnage of goods today. <laughs> And after more than a century, a map of the waterways that still carry a fair amount of traffic would look like this. The network has contracted. What does it amount to now? We have inherited many canals which can only go the way of others before them. 
They do not serve areas important enough even to justify the dredging they need, let alone reconstruction. But they need not become derelict. An old canal has other uses. They provide a water supply for vital industrial undertakings. Power stations take thousands of gallons a day from the canals. And sometimes it may even be more important to keep up the levels for these purposes than for normal trade. Many canals, although they are not used for commercial traffic, are still kept open by maintenance boats because they provide water for sections which are still busy. Like the Ellesmere Canal in North Wales. And in addition, there is the really important part, the still considerable mileage which is serving the needs of thriving industrial areas. If we were starting from scratch now, perhaps we should build the canals differently. But it's no good thinking of them in those terms. They exist, and they're worth something as they stand. And we have inherited a tradition. The tradition of the narrow boat, with its roses and castles and its boating families. The Wallingtons and the Hambridges, the Lowes and the Tollies, the Prestons and the Buns, who rarely marry outside their own community and whose children are born and bred on the boats, in a cabin a few feet square. The boats are their homes. They're often on the move, summer and winter, in good weather and bad, for three or four weeks at a time. It is hard on the mothers, and harder still on their children. Canal children must be given the life and the opportunities of any other child in England today. This problem can be, and is being, solved. On the broad canals, the life is different because the boats can move faster. There's a home ashore, a standing wage, so that the men can live the sort of life that any craftsman enjoys. The boats carry bigger loads, up to 200 tons apiece, sometimes more. A motor barge and the dumb boats it can tow may be shifting as much as five or 600 tons at a time. It's worth spending money to improve waterways like these, to make good the banks where they've slipped, and to strengthen them with steel piling, to straighten bends and keep the channel dredged. Every inch off the bottom means that boats can carry bigger loads. And far inland, on the banks of the canals and the rivers, stands mile upon mile of storage space. Warehouse and wharfside stockpile, transit shed, and silo, connected by the waterways with the ports and docks on which Britain's prosperity depends. That's by water, X pile, 18 tons button blanks, 10 tons silicon metal, 250 tons aluminum ingots. 1,200 bushels Manitoba wheat loaded for Worcester. With reference to our memo of October 3rd, please note the following boats are to load timber immediately. 500 sacks Canadian white flour ex Nottingham warehouse. Two boatloads bag salt for delivery Sokoto via the Papa. To order of trade is limited. 1,000 tons scrap metal, ex steamship merchant prince. There go the boats. The boats and the people of the boats and the cargoes they carry upon the waterways of England. Mm -hmm.